Shalom all. Ariel Bar Tzedok here from the Kosher Torah School. Found online where else? www.koshertorah.com. Wishing you a Hag Sameach coming up. We really don't say Hag Sameach. We say Shana Tova. Uh, consider maybe a early for Sukkot coming up. But anyway, Shavua Tov. Good week to everybody. Um, as we know, we're in the countdown now to the Rosh Hashanah period. So we wish everyone a Shana Tova, a good year. We'll say Tiskul Shanim Robot, which means may everybody be blessed with prosperous times. Gemar Hatima Tova, may you be finished for a good inscription in the Book of Life. And an early Hag Sukkot coming up. But anyway, tonight's topic, we we'll talk about something, I don't know, we bit controversial maybe? Well, we'll discuss that in a minute. I entitled it about the Watchers and their role in Rosh Hashanah. We've been talking a number of things with regards to the understandings of the Rosh Hashanah holiday coming up, uh, Yom Adin, the Day of Judgment, and all these types of things. And we're going to we'll elaborate now more into this and go into some biblical teachings, which most people are familiar with, maybe some of the rabbinic teachings, and of course, Kabbalistic teachings. Now, for those of you who want to follow along, this is my book, Aliens, Angels, and Demons. I probably shouldn't put that in front of my face, right? Isn't that what they say? You know, when you're on camera, everything has to look right. Remember, this is all live stuff here. I don't have any directors or anything. This is all me just doing it. So if it gets fudged, what can I tell you? I'm not fancy like the other guys who get it all, you know, edited. With me, it's all raw. What you see is what you get. But anyway, this is my book. Which side does it go on? There we go. Got to make it there. Aliens, Angels, and Demons. I came out with this book specifically for my audience uh, for the uh, television program uh, Ancient Aliens uh, on the History Channel. As many of you know, I've been on the program for many, many years. And many of the ideas, topics, and beliefs of the program, needless to say, are not uh, in alignment with anything biblical, certainly not shared by me. But you should know many of the members of the executive staff of Prometheus Productions Nice Jewish people, lovely, sweet people. As a matter of fact, the entire Prometheus staff are great people. I've gotten to know them a number of times at our alien conferences that we've had. And working with them, like I said, sweethearts. And I'm honored that as an Orthodox rabbi, they have expressed interest in a biblical point of view of these things. And when we've done the conferences uh, in California, we've done now two, and coming up this November 2018, we'll be in Baltimore and then back in L.A. in uh, spring 2019. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people show up, and I'm stunned that people actually, like, know who I am and are interested. What's going on here? I don't want to end it. I'm getting all kinds of weird things going on. Hopefully my battery is not going to run out. You know what? Give me a second now. Look here, make sure everything is operational. Oh, good. <laughs> I always got to check and make sure. I love live video. You see all the slips, all the everything. Love it. But you know, part and parcel of what I teach here at the Kosher Torah School is about being raw and honest. So that's why I don't do editing or fancy things to try to polish things up. I show you like it is. And when it comes to the Torah teachings. I do that for the Ancient Alien Program. I do that for my students here at our school, and I'm here to do this for you. And I cover topics that a lot of people, more so, this is fun, I have to admit, in the rationalist schools of Orthodox Judaism, find extremely uncomfortable. You know, ever since the rationalist movement developed out of Europe in the past few centuries, it has pretty much dominated much of uh, modern Orthodox Judaism, um, where in which relationship with or awareness of not only just Kabbalistic or for that matter Hasidic literature, but even the concepts therein are many people just bluntly ignorant of these things. They have almost next to no spiritual experiences whatsoever, and they've transformed, at least in their minds, Judaism to be a philosophical system void of any type of metaphysical and or supernatural or spiritual interactions. And as such, you know, they use the, what we call in Kabbalah, the Sefirat Bina brain, 
which is the rational intellect, but they leave out the intuitive psychic. So fundamentally, the rationalist of that ilk is fundamentally half-brained, nyuk, 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 but it's true. Even Carl Jung noticed this when he spoke about the importance of the value of spirit in understanding the integration of the human mind and experience. So whenever you see these of the rationalist ilk and you start talking to them like our sages in the Talmud did about angels and demons and interactions, life after death, talking with spirits and the like. They either will either claim ignorance, they don't know anything about this type of stuff, or they'll say, ah, oh, it's old stuff, we don't believe in that anymore, which is not true, it's part and parcel of our Torah. Or they will run to the individual or minority opinions of this or that rabbi or group of rabbis who say, yeah, well, we don't believe in that, or we don't uh, hold like that, etc., and so on. And they literally try to, you know, you know, sweep under the rug all of the real spiritual experiences. Now, it's not the topic of tonight, but I'm going to tell you something that I was taught by my Rebbe Meir years and years ago, Lava Shalom. Actually, there was another rabbi, an American rabbi, I'm not going to mention him, who, a uh, Sephardi gentleman, who uh, apparently, I think it was his grandfather, was uh, at the time in North Africa. And apparently, from what I understood, there was a time, I think it was in the 20s or the early 30s, where a group of Kabbalistic rabbis together had a singular dream, making them aware that the Holocaust was coming to Europe as a gezera, an ordinance from God. And, you know, the Kabbalists did indeed fight long and hard to, against the Nazis. There was a real psychic war going on. And the only ones who were successful in keeping the Nazis out, of course, were the Sephardic rabbis of North Africa and Israel. Many of you might not be familiar with the uh, story of what Rabbi Yehuda Fatia did. Uh, it was actually reported in the Jerusalem Post um, newspaper. They made a book about it, but they really got it wrong. Word in which Rabbi Yehuda Fatia, when Rommel's armies was marching across North Africa, uh, Rabbi Yehuda Fatia made a an approach to the British military saying that from a Kabbalistic point, they can do something about it. From what the story said in the Jerusalem Post newspaper, go go look this up. I mean, I, I saw this, this is back in 1980s, so we we're dating this, but according to the story, the British military gave Rabbi Yehuda Fatih and the Kabbalists a, a plane, and they made this big circle around Eretz Israel, and they were doing sacrifices, Kabbalistic ritual, and according to the article, or the essay, the newspaper article, it was at that exact place that they flew over, where the Kabbalistic ritual and the wall, the psychic wall was made, that Rommel fell at El Alamein. Now that's the story, that is what is told. My Rebbe Meir told me a story that the Kabbalists in Bet El got together to perform what's called the psychic assassination of Adolf Hitler. And they said that the Malach of Adolf Hitler came and challenged them in Bet El and the Kabbalists broke rank. They, they were terrified and ran. And it was claimed, Rabbi Meir told me, that uh, Rabbi Huda Fatih had a face of it alone. And that might have, you know, had something to do with his early demise. So what the story was, was because the rationalist influence had uh, had permeated throughout Europe, Europe had no real Kabbalists left. They had academians, they had philosophers, they had no practitioners like a Baal Shem Tov, who knew how to manipulate forces and powers like the Sephardim, and therefore what happened happened. Now, I can't ascertain or verify or validate the truth of that spiritual relationship. All I can tell you, these are the stories and the words that I was told by my teachers and those, you know, sources that I just shared with you. Now, it's important that when I emphasize this, that this is just a story, but it also places emphasis on what I shared about the importance of spiritual growth 
spiritual experience, which has been part and parcel of our Torah tradition since biblical times. So, as I said, that the topic of our chat tonight is about the watchers, angels. And all throughout biblical history, there's always been interaction with angels. Our sages of the Talmud interacted with spiritual beings all the time. Certainly, the masters of the Kabbalah have till modern times. This is not a unique phenomenon, and it is not just a figment of any one individual's imagination, as some rationalists might want to say. It's curious that those who are doing experimentations, even with certain types of you know, chemicals and the like, uh, are realizing that those who take certain types of drugs to expand consciousness, not necessarily LSD, but other stuff, are recognizing in their, in quote, altered states of consciousness, that they become aware of the presences of others around. And those, in quote, others around are no surprise to us. Indeed, it is a very, very famous midrash that states that to every single blade of grass, there is a malach that says that, you know, encourages it, grow, grow, grow. We call it, it's mazal. Now, mazel, like we say in the vernacular, mazel tov. Some would say that's the power of the astrology, but you're missing the point. You see, the planets and their movements are just bodies. It's the energies and essences behind them, within them, that make that energy that we call today mazalot or astrology to have influence. Now, let's understand astronomical influence is a matter of science astrological influence is an art or in other words it deals with the psychological the intuitive the psychic mind for those people who then want to say well there's nothing to astrology you know, believe whatever you want but you'll find that the vast majority of our sages were not so willing to be dismissive as those who want to dismiss astrology. Now, Rambam Maimonides, who in all due respect truly had an understanding of the secrets of the Torah, never wanted to encourage and therefore dismissed any astrological influence. But at the same time, our Rambam Maimonides makes it very clear in the Hilchot Yeso de Torah Go look it up, chapter three, that planets, stars, not only are they alive, they are conscious beings, they are sentient beings, they know themselves, they know God. So, even though Rambam might wave his hand and say astrology is not true, he is acknowledging and put into the code of law the underlying essence of what makes astrology work. And that is, that just like you and I have a body and a soul, so does everything else. That little blade of grass that's out there, that in quote angel over it is its soul. Mother Earth, good old mama, has her soul. We all have souls, regardless of our form of life. I don't go tell that to my ancient alien buddies out there in Cali. But... But well, now we want to come to understand planets. Well, Rambam said, they're alive. Well, we understand that. We've always understood that. Even Ramban Nahmani states that the angels are the souls of the planets. Now, two things from the Bible. We are very familiar with a very famous, I don't know, warning Revelation of the book of Daniel, chapter 4, where in which it speaks of ones called Irin. We translate that as watchers. And in the Midrashic literature, specifically the book of Enoch, and that's Sefer Hanoch, the first one we call it. No, it's not written by the real Enoch. Pretty much came out around Hanukkah time, around 2nd century BCE. Um, and it's what we call a pseudepigrapha, readily available in gazillion translations. Uh, I would try to stick with the more authoritative academic ones that get more of an academic review of the text. But anyway, <laughs> after everything I said about the, the rationalists, right? But okay, 
There aren't that many people who are doing psychic readings of, of the Sefer Chanukh today. I think I'm like one of the only weirdos out there who does these types of things. But hey, I know I'm not alone. What can I say? Just don't know who's writing it out like me or teaching it. But anyway, getting back to the point. The watchers are pretty much in charge of things. This is a message that Daniel makes very clear in the Bible. This is a group of angels whose job it is, as ordained by God, to pretty much direct the affairs of humankind. And they're in charge. They are the bosses. So who are these, in quote, watchers? Well, we know one thing. We associate another group of angels, for lack of a better word to call them. We find them originally referenced by this name in the Sefer Yetzira, and they're called the Teli. Teli, by lack of any other word, would mean reptilian or dragons. And yeah, in the Christian tradition, the image of the dragon is considered bad. Indeed, you'll even find an opinion in the Gemara itself, Tractate Abel Dazara, that says the image of the dragon is idolatry. And if and when your approach to the reptilian race is to worship them as authorities and superiors, then that by all means is idolatry. For that matter, to look up to, suck up to, as we say, right? Any higher authority, human, government, or rabbinic can equally be idolatrous rather than put our complete, total, full trust in God. Make sure that that is always understood. Shevit Hashem l'negdi tamid. I place God before me always. Not my rabbis, not my religion, not angels. So who are these Tili? Well, again, the Sefer Yitzira, written within a century or so of Talmudic times, makes a very curious statement about them. It states that the Tali rule in the universe like a king upon the throne. And when we put together the various literature that we know about these Tali, we see that they are essentially the watchers referred to in the Bible. Now, uh, Arya Kaplan makes a reference to the Tali uh, in his commentary to the Sefer Yetzirah, quoting an old Kabbalistic magic book called the Shoshan Yesod Olam. Um, it's never been published, thank God. Uh, but there are those of us who have copies of, of things like that and know how these things operate. It's always been part and parcel of our rabbinic prophetic traditions, how to make contact. When Abu Lafia writes in all of his multiple literatures about, you know, the techniques of using combinations and permutations of letters and stuff, he doesn't talk about making contact, but he does make it very clear that he knows who's out there. Even Maimonides, who never talks outright about meditation, clearly reveals his wisdom and knowledge when he, especially when he discusses his revelations of the Merkaba and the more Nebuchim in third section there. You can nod your head and say, this man knows what he's talking about. Yes, he was hiding secrets. I have long said and taught in our kosher Torah school, that which we today call Kabbalah, I refer to specifically as anything so horrically related and beyond, or in other words, ahead in history. Anything before that, I don't call Kabbalah. I call it Sitre Torah, or the secrets of the Torah. Because the original and authentic Sitre Torah traditions are different from the Zohar traditions. The Zohar tradition, the Lurianic traditions, and everything that came in that direction are mostly, but not all, theoretical in nature. So most of my peers do a good day talking, will tell you a great a bunch of philosophy. Some will even try to teach a basic meditation. But usually it's mostly psychological or philosophically based. And it's never psychically based to expand your psychic abilities, to give you the opportunity to become aware of and to commune with those who are out there. And indeed, the watchers, they are out there. Let's go right back to the Bible. Very famous chapter in the book of Job, chapter one, where it speaks about the gathering of the sons of God. And along comes this one guy called Satan. All right, let's talk about that. Let's understand this. Personally, for those of you who've 
ever been through my kosher Torah school library, you know I offer over 100 hours of more free stuff on my website, koshertorah.com. We offer a whole bunch of stuff, of course, on our now YouTube channel. But most of our courses are, you know, for our donating, supporting students. And I cannot encourage you enough, please support our school. Join us. Become a monthly supporter, donator, so that I can give you access to everything I have. Bottom line, this is school. I wish that uh, I, I could run it like a real yeshiva and not have to worry about dollars and cents. But unfortunately, got to worry about that stuff. Got to pay the bills. So, you know, I look to you. You look to me. And hopefully we work together in that respect. But getting back now to the book of Job. I've always had a problem with the book of Job. It's always bothered me. What? Never could get past the first couple of chapters. When I read this story of how, you know, God and the Satan are into this, you know, little Las Vegas style, little gambling stuff. Consider Job. Yeah, blah, 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 this. And all of a sudden, the Satan comes and wipes out Job's whole family. <laughs> Snap of the fingers. And I always said to myself, wait a second. That's not God's justice. That's not the way things happen. And then, after all so many years, I became aware of what the Gemara taught. I became aware of what Rambam mentions. The book of Job wasn't a historical book. It was a novel. It was a story that was written to be novelic, and therefore the details of it did not have to worry itself about historical concerns. It was meant to teach us the lessons of wisdom that the book contains, and that completely transformed the entire book, and I'm in awe of the wisdom of our biblical authors. So we come to the first chapter and we recognize that there A is something called a day of gathering or day of judgment. And this Satan, remember what the word Satan means. It's not a name. There's no guy out there. There's no angel out there. His name is Satan. There's no Lucifer or any of these other things. This is all mythologies that have developed over many, many years. Even later, Kabbalistic literature, remember I described that, when they're referencing the angel Samael. And no, I'm not afraid to say his name. All right? He's not coming in here with a pitchfork and poking me in the rear end or anything of the kind. I'll tell you a little secret that the Arizal reveals about Samael. He is a faithful servant of God, just like Michael and Gabriel and Raphael and Oriel. He is that Malach behind the planet Mars, as they say. And this is so profound. The Arizal says when all the literature says he's going to be destroyed in the end, what that means is his name is going to be changed. And instead of being Samach Mem, Aleph Lamed, the Mem will be taken away and his name will just be Samach Aleph Lamed, which for those of you who do not know, it is one of the three, it is one of the 72 triad sacred holy names of God. And it's a very profound name. Samach is 60. Aleph is 1. 30. El, Lamed, is 30. 91. Do your Kabbalistic Gematria. That's the union of the name Yudke Vavke and Adonai. To show that Samakel, and this is one of the big secrets that's brought down by Rabbi Todros Abu Lafia in his uh, Shara Kavod. Metatron. Remember the big archangel who's over all Israel is the collective soul of all higher humanity? And Samael are twin brothers. They are the symbolic metaphorical Jacob and Esau above. Two sides of the same coin. All right, good and evil. Or in other words, both in the service of God. And that is something radically different from the Christian tradition, even a little bit different from later Kabbalistic tradition. But it becomes, it, it's very clear from the book of Job, this Satan, he's not an arch enemy of God. He's not a rival of God. He doesn't have this separate domain called hell that's out there to go and get your souls and some type of eternal damnation. None of these things have any Judaic value. None of these things have any Judaic foundation. And nowhere in the Bible, Jewish Bible, where you find these things. Any and all references that our sages make to the Satan and all the rest is done for medrashic purposes only to help edify and inspire us to do righteousness and good. And a little bit of fear of God and the fear of the stuff out there isn't such an unhealthy thing. But we don't need to be 
scared like little children. We need to grow up mature and understand, just like the Bible teaches us. So understand then, God created, ordained a specific office of angel, like a prosecutor. Their angel's job is to go out and to test the weak, to push at the weak spot, to make it strong. I'll give a great example. For those of you who know, I'm very, very emphatic about the importance of physical health, uh, you know, bodybuilding, martial arts, and the like. For those of you who've ever done any kind of training, you know, ow, it hurts. Man, it's, it's rough. Well, when I'm going to the gym and I'm bench pressing X amount of pounds and the like, and I have soreness in my muscles, is that the evil inclination trying to stop me? Is that the satan in my flesh trying to get me? Uh, no. It's an old statement. No pain, no gain. Understand that's the way God works. The reason for the existence of a satan, a prosecutor, is not to push us down, but to motivate us to go forward. All right, I'm going to give you a little insight into the nature of Aliyah sent. In the earliest literature, we speak about the sent through the gates. Well, there are angels at the gates, and their job is to keep out those who are not worthy. Now, if you go up to a gate through a meditative process and you're ascending and you meet one of these entities and you're not worthy, um, no, they're not going to kill you. You're not going to go insane. You're not going to spend the rest of your life in an insane asylum. But they do project the power of thought against you and bounce you. Happens to a lot of people in dreams all the time. Well, why are they there? No pain, no gain. When you refine yourself, but what we call in traditional Judaism, Torah, mitzvot, ma'asim, tovim. You're living a righteous, holy life. You're expanding the power of the mind, according to Rambam, according to the prophetic Kabbalah. Then you're properly, if you will, energetically calibrated. And then when you approach these entities in the visionary quest and they seek to stop you, you push them out of the way and they acquiesce to you. And they say, welcome, because you're worthy. And that is how one ascends through the gates. Baal Shem Tov did this. So this is a well-known practice in our Torah traditions. So with that being said, understand and know then this position of the Satan, he is only doing the job that God sends him to do. If I should say him, it's a whole bunch. So he is one of these watchers, just like so many others are. And their job is to, if you will, look after human souls and not let any ascend before our time. That's what it's all about. We are all like children on this planet, and we will recycle over and over and over again, reincarnation, until our souls are at a point where we can ascend. And that requires of us significant spiritual development, Meditative practice, the development of the psychic powers of the mind, what Rambam would call the perfection of the powers of the mind, the integration of what, again, Rambam would call the imaginative faculty with the uh, intuitive, rational faculty. That's why when you study Gemara, Talmud, you'll notice it goes from the rational to the intuitive, the intuitive, the rational, Agadot Talacha, back and forth, forth and back. It's to teach us, to train our minds to go in the flow, back and forth into the rational, into the intuitive, what we call from Hochma to Bina, Bina to Hochma, I call this Sechel Tenuda, or oscillating consciousness. Now, let's take all of this and tie it up to Rosh Hashanah. I put something out on my Facebook page called The Secret of the Tali. Uh, and I'm terrible at getting the cameras right and things over my face. So if I don't do it so properly, tough. <laughs> all right? Secrets of the Tilly, there you can see it there. You don't need to see me. You remember what I look like. All right. I'll have it on my website at www.koshertorah.com forward slash PDF, all in caps, forward slash Tilly, T-E-L-I dot small case PDF. And that'll be available up there. You can go play this back in the recording. You'll get that you know URL again. But anyway, you know, let me let, let, let me read this to you. This is from a Rishon, one of the earlier generation rabbis, whose name is Rabbi Menachem Tziuni, 
from his book called the Sefer Tzionim Parashat Ahare. And he speaks about these to Lee. And he says, the ministers of the Zodiac that reside in the air, these are the princes of the Tali. The reason they are called princes of the Tali is because these princes belong the leadership of all the hosts above. By their mouths, all the spheres of heaven go forth. And by their mouths, all the spheres of heaven stay still. In the language of our sages, this is called the Nahash Bariach. All right, that's the serpent. And the Akhtalion, the winding serpent. That's the Euroboros. That's the serpent that eats its own tail. All of this is symbolic language. The astrologers call it the tail of the dragon, the head of the dragon, meaning good and evil. For all are born of the head are good and of the tail evil. Metatron, Samakel. Mm, there we go. These princes are the souls of the spheres. For each sphere vibrates. Each has a separate intelligence that guides it in accordance to the secret of the emanation of the name that radiates upon it. The princes of the Dali themselves are influenced from the angels above, the four princes above, the angels of the Merkava. So, the spirits of the planets, those are these angels. The Tali are the guardians and the watchers of our earth. They're the ones who make a circle, if you will, psychically, energetically around us. And their job is to, like shepherds, corral the human race, to nudge us, guide us, direct us, all by divine design, to spiritual growth. Now, Remember Isaiah 55, God's thoughts are not our thoughts, God's ways are not our ways. When God wants something done on earth, it might not meet our criteria of, shall we say, mercy, kindness, niceness, and the like. Something's happening with my camera. I'm bouncing in and out live here. I have no idea. Love this live stuff with all the foibles therein. But anyway, getting back to this, I guess the Tali don't like me talking about them. <laughs> I should have done that on camera. Somehow, somewhere, somebody's going to make a picture of that somewhere. I know I'm going to regret that. Like I said, I love live stuff. But anyway, um, <laughs> understand now, everything is by divine design. There's no other reality other than God. God's in charge of everything, including me making crazy dumb stuff, which every now and then I do. And this is my point. Today, we're in a major social issue discussion about privacy rights and the like. Well, let me put it to you bluntly. There's no such thing as privacy. You don't have any privacy. Not only is everything that you're doing being monitored, not by the government or this new world order or any of these other spooks out there, who cares about them? Do you really think that the, in quote, new world order cares about what you do in the privacy of your room? Really? You think you're so important that what you do matters to the world? Okay, maybe you have a little bit of delusions and grandeur there. I'm not a big one for conspiracy theories. I could care less if the government is, is watching me or watching you or watching us. Who cares, right? That's all the respect. If anybody's watching me, I'm sure by now I owe them an apology for boring them. But God is watching. The angelic order is watching. Every thought that we think is monitored, known in the collective consciousness. You have no privacy because that which we call the spiritual realm, the angelic realm, knows everything. And as we flow through space and time and come under the Libra influences of Chodesh Tishrei, the month of Tishrei, which is what we call the time of balancing, just like it speaks about in the book of Job. Then the symbolic story of the sons of God coming and the matters and accountings come in and all of the angelic order, if you will, realigns itself in relationship to human consciousness where you and I are at. And then the flow of God comes down. And you're going to receive good if you're in proper alignment, or you're going to receive bad if you're not. Blessing and curse, the book of life, or the book of death, or the book in the middle. That's how this stuff works. And God works through those who God himself has ordained. The watchers are the ones who implement 
the divine decree. So therefore, we, number one, never ever approach the watchers to supplicate for us. That is idolatry. Their job is to do what God tells them to do. If and when we would ever communicate with them, all they do is point directions. All they do is might give us information because they're conduits, they're servants, they're under the angels of the Merkava. So for those with experience, they will maybe become aware of the teli. For many who are not trained, they might experience or visualize them in a terrifying form, be frightened of them. For those who are aware and knowledgeable, we'll welcome them as our spiritual bigger brothers. So essentially, it is the image of the dragon, which was well known in both ancient Hebraic culture and ancient Chinese culture, to be kadosh, holy. And this goes all the way back to the Bible, when you can see the serpent in the Garden of Eden. Remember, the original serpent, our sages said, stood erect, had arms and legs, and spoke. All right? So what? don't go thinking that the serpent in the Garden of Eden was like a modern-day snake. When was the last time you ever spoke with a snake? You got answers, right? Mm-mm. It was a different time. It was a reptilian humanoid. Mm, sound familiar to the those of you in the ET circles and our conspiratorial stuff? Well, just remember, the Tilly are a race. You have good guys, you have bad guys. Good and evil. Remember we said that? So that's what's going on out there. And only those who are properly calibrated in that which we call Kedusha can make the proper ascents to have experience in a Kadosh holy way. Of course, that's what our whole kosher Torah school is about, fulfilling the prayer and prayer, you know, revelation of the Baal Shem Tov, making aliyot in proper kedusha. That's that's what we teach. But anyway, understand now, these entities, according to our traditions, are real. They're out there. They're doing their job, and that's just the way it is. Also, understand that in the book of Isaiah, remember in chapter six, it speaks about the seraphim. Well, you go look at the Seraphim. Those aren't the burning ones. Those are the reptilian ones. They are in the Hechal, right? These are the images of the Tali. These are the, if you will, the feet that underneath the Merkaba. They are the servants of the two Kerobim on the Ark of the Covenant who were Metatron and Sandalphon. These are the entities beneath them. So we should never ever fear because their job is not to be bad or evil. Yeah, I said there are bad ones out there, but when you're properly calibrated in Kedusha, holiness, they don't bother with you. Their job is to train us. That's all. So understand their role for Rosh Hashanah. They're benign or whatever. The job ultimately is to do what needs to be done. And that is what this is all about. So here we are now coming up to Rosh Hashanah. I'm going to take your questions in about two minutes. Let me finish up here. Understand and know that the Tilly, I read more about this, like I said, my book, Aliens, Angels, and Demons. I write all the different sources, the correlations, and my, and, 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 uh, my source materials. It's all quoted in there. And recognize and know we have nothing to be afraid of. There are forces out there, and they're good and evil based upon our own good and evil within ourselves. I know many people who sometimes have, you know, dreams and feelings and thoughts which are very, very negative. They say, well, cognitive behavioral therapy. Change the way you think. Change the way you feel. That's actually the tikkun language of the Arizal. And it's very important to understand. You have nothing to be afraid of. There's no forces of, or dominions of evil out there that can do anything to you if you are properly calibrated in righteousness and holiness doing the right thing. It doesn't matter who you are, what you are, where you are. It's not a Jewish thing. It's a human thing. And it transcends that too. So by you being the moral, decent, right human being that you are, you get it right. I'm seeing a comment here in text that King Solomon used to speak with the jinn. He certainly did. 
remember, it's actually written in the tractate Gittin. I did have a course, uh, not a course, but a class on that in my Enyako series from the, from the Gemara. I'll be getting these things online as well. Where it's a well known story where it says that King Solomon uh, got the assistance of Ashmodai, the king of the demons, to build the temple because there were ways and means that the temple needed to be built with the Shamir, but no human being had the knowledge of technology to, to use. So we got them involved, and they built those secret places in the Beit HaMikdash and under the Temple Mount, but to this day, you know, secret secrets. But okay, kahaze. And for those, again, of the rationalist school who wanted to dismiss all of these things as, as fantasical beliefs and the like, fine, <laughs> believe whatever you want. But by dismissing that, you're dismissing major, major portions of, of our Torah traditions. And as far as I'm concerned, that's not kosher. But okay, I'm going to conclude here. You understand now the role of the watchers on Rosh Hashanah. Their job is to do what God tells them to do. Understand that this has biblical foundations, Talmudic foundations, Kabbalistic foundations. And I pray that each and every one of us, as we come into the influence of the Rosh Hashanah period, the time of judgment, don't go around thinking that you're going to become, you know, superficially religious and gain brownie points from God as if God is some kind of, you know, spiritual Santa Claus. Let's be a little bit more sophisticated, please. Change your lives. Be better human beings. Be generous human beings. Give financially to the charities of your choice. Always be moral and righteous. Don't be an SOB. Don't be a liar. Don't be a cheat. Be an honest, decent human being. And as an old saying, I believe attributed to the Native Americans, walk your talk. Be a decent, moral human being. Rabbi Chaim Vital, the great Kabbalist, writes in his introduction to the book Shari Kedusha, Midot Kadmon La Mitzvot. Before you can be a completely Torah observant, faithful Jew, for example, you have to be first a good, moral, decent human being. Please, I cannot encourage you, men and women alike, this is something that applies to all of us. Be a decent human being. And the Tzali will be proud of you. And the gates of ascent will be open for you. And you will see the difference in your lives. All you need is just a little itsy-bitsy bit of faith in God. Do the right thing. And something tells me that I'm actually something speaking to individuals out there. You know what I mean? And there are things that you as individuals have to do. Like Nike says in the commercials, just do it. And that we say, Hashem lo tov batamim. Be an innocent, decent human being, and God will hold back nothing from you. You will find that which you seek. All righty. On that note, I'm going to put on my good old reading glasses here. And let me go into questions and see if I can pop up. Anybody's got any questions? How do I scroll this far down? There we go. All right. Now, if you have any questions, now's the time to ask them. Please type them into text so I can answer them. I have a question here from Noach. Shalom, Noach. Shavuotov. How do you know if you are appropriately spiritual aligned to approach the Tali? How about studying good old fashioned? Musar of our Torah. You want to know? Read books like the Misilat Yisharim of Rabbi Moshe Haim Luzato, the famous Ramchal. He made his ascents. Read his stuff. He wrote his own Tikkuni Zohar from scratch. He was talking to all the spirits so much that he freaked out the rabbis that they bounced him out of Europe. All right? He knew. Follow that path. Simple stuff. This is not difficult to understand. Sometimes you might consider it difficult to practice, but that's your problem, right? If you say, I want to have a physically strong body when I go to the gym, don't go around once a month to the gym lifting three pound weights three times and expect to, you know, have an Arnold Schwarzenegger body. It doesn't work like that. No pain, no gain. Invest in your spiritual strength as well. Practice real meditation, not this relaxation nonsense. Transpersonal introspective expansion of consciousness this is what i teach in my courses here become a student of our school see what i have to offer you engage practice 
I will not give you an answer. Are you ready or not? I can't give you a certificate for that. But you will know from your own internal psychology, spirituality, and your own dreams and visions. Let's see. Anybody else have anything to say? Yes, no, maybe so. You read what? That's a question. I read what? I don't know what I read. I read a whole bunch of stuff. So, okay. Any other questions? Yes, no, maybe so. We're really running short of time. Going once, going twice. I feel, I feel like, what, what do they call that? In the auction here? I don't know how to do that. How blah, 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 stuff that the auctioneers do. But all right. I, I, I'm not scrolling up and looking for questions. If you don't have the questions here. Okay, what do we got here? Is speaking to the Tali the same or similar to trying to converse with my higher self, Magid, Sammy asks. Well, no. Your higher self is one thing. The Tali are not the higher you. They're out there on the sides. For those who go up the center column, we connect with our higher self. The Tali are kind of like on the side. They're external. Many a time, as you're making the ascent up, you kind of like look to the right or to the left, and there they are. Now, you will find warnings, even in the writings like Pantanjali, you know, in the Raja, Raja Yoga Sutras, all right, of Pantanjali, when he speaks about the development of the psychic powers, he says, don't be deceived by them. These are the things that get you to look off to the sides. And we don't go off to the sides. Well, what does that mean about our relationship with the Tali? The Tali are there. Not all the time do we ascend up. Sometimes we just go up for a bit and we look around. What are we looking around for? Go to the Gemara for that. And you'll see that sometimes the sages wanted insights and information from the forces that know how things trickle down. The edicts of God as we say, emanate down from the spiritual planes and about 30 days or so, about a moon's energy between implementation to actualization, they become known in these higher realms. And the sages, like the Kabbalists before the Holocaust, can connect to, and if you will, foresee the future. The higher self doesn't always have access to that information, but these peripherals on the side do, and that is where a lot of this information comes from. So a lot of people who are interactive in, I don't know, the psychic realms and trying to, in quote, predict the future, if it's short-term things of things that are already, if you will, ordained by God about to materialize, it is possible to pick up these things. And the Talia are the ones who know it, and those are the ones who people connect to. So hopefully I answered that question. All right, what do we got next here? Uh, okay, what's Julie have to say? If the serpent in the Garden of Eden is a reptilian, and he mated with Eve and conceived Cain, and Noah is the descendant of both Cain and Seth, how did Noah get to be a descendant of Cain? I, don't, I missed that one. Uh, does that mean that all humans have reptilian DNA? <laughs> okay, now. We're mixing metaphor with literal. According to Kabbalistic tradition, it is stated that uh, the serpent mated with Eve and became the father of Cain. I don't think that that was a literal uh, interpretation, but I think that meant was an energetic essence of that which we in quote call evil. And that is what became integrated into the human experience, the physical world where in which human beings are called Eve. Remember, Adam and Eve is also a symbolic metaphor. So when it speaks about Cain and Abel, the Arizal speaks about this in great detail about the Cain and Abel souls, okay? And uh, when we say reptilian, it's not reptilian DNA, but in quote, symbolic, metaphorical reptilian influence, meaning that side which we call evil. Now, what is evil? Evil, again, means tree of life, all right, everything, powers that go up, powers that go down. That's pretty much what it is. In our Torah tradition, we always refer to this, Chinese tradition, they refer to it as the yin and the yang, the opposites and polarity. We refer to it as heaven and earth, the physical and the spiritual. It's, it's spoken about in all the different cultures of the world and all different philosophical descriptions and metaphors. 
So that is what it means when it says, in quote, that the serpent mated with Eve. Not that there was a physical snake with a, you know what, doing that to a physical woman with any kind of like rape fantasy of the kind. It's all symbolism. So no, we don't, shouldn't be go looking for reptilian DNA in us, alien DNA in us. Sorry to my buddies out in ancient aliens, but this is all ancient archetypal metaphorical language to help us understand the nature of, if you will, our human experience and the struggle that we have between the physical and the spiritual, which we again call the good and the evil. Okay, that is what that's all about. Judy, that was a great question. Thank you, Julie. All right, again, really running short on time. Somebody says that's Gnostic. There is, remember, a lot of this Gnostic teachings that came out in the first, second century, right, came out of Jewish Midrash, and it mixed with a lot of Christian teachings as well, and a lot of what's in quote today called Gnosticism is found in later rabbinic, Christian, Kabbalistic, and other mystical schools. Yes, it is. All right. When you trace the history of ideas and beliefs, you will find that, you know, all these things connect over history. So thank you for that, Monique. If the serpent was a companion of Adam, then Hashem must have known about the multiple possibility outcomes of such a companion for Adam, correct? I think God knows everything. I mean, that's what we call God as a perfection. Remember this whole story in the Garden of Eden? I mean, it sounds like a setup, doesn't it? And if we look at it literally, it just doesn't read right. So this is why we must understand with the wisdom of our sages how these things are symbolic. And they're meant to tell us deeper tales about our humanity. We're not worried about where the Garden of Eden was. We're worried about our humanity and the nature of the struggle that we have between our physicality focused on the external and our, in quote, spirituality, power of the mind, Ramam would say, which is our internal, extrovert, introvert. This is that balance that we have to deal with at all times. And when we can balance this, and in our Torah tradition, what is our way? Eastern traditions? ascend we descend answer meaning we bring heaven down to earth we're not so interested in rising up to heaven and leaving the earth behind adios no our job is to bring heaven down to earth make this place kadosh that everything that we do becomes kadosh eating becomes kadosh sexual intimacy between husband and wife becomes kadosh everything becomes kadosh and that's exactly what it's all about that is what we call the tikkun and when the talis see that then they know they have someone who's able to ascend why because they're not trying to run away they're trying to fulfill the obligation of bringing the light down that is tikkun that is the, what we call the tov mashiach that's the secret behind what we call the resurrection of the dead all these metaphors play into this it's all about making ourselves better all right let's see what does cc say brilliant discussion okay thank you but no question all right any other questions how to fight or protect yourself or others close to you from evil or witches and the other side boris i wrote my book protection of evil specifically to answer that question it's available for you online the fundamental basic thing you cannot be afraid of evil you cannot be afraid of the negative thought projections of others you must have faith in god Trust in God. This is why I do my shvitis that you find, you know, you'll see on my website. I, I send them out for free. You can purchase other ones online. You put them up all over your homes, your offices, just to have the presence of God in your memory and your reminder so you can trust in God. Everything revolves around that trusting in God. Sadiq be'emunato yechiyei. Habakkuk said that. The Gemara Masechet Makot says all the Torah is summed up in that one commandment. The righteous live by faith. Just have faith in God. Focus only on God. All this other complications in the world doesn't go away, but you recognize the integration and unity of it all. The world is full of God's glory. In old mi levado, there is nothing other than the reality of God. Focus on that, and we're blessed. We have gone way over time. My goodness. Alrighty, guys. Let me conclude here and thanking you all for being with me. I'm going to be on the road. I'm uh, going to be traveling shortly. So the next live class we have will not be here, 
So it's going to be from some location which I'll announce at that time. So until then, Ariel Bart Sadok here from the Kosher Torah School, koshertorah.com. I thank you all for your continuing support of our organization. Please donate generously to us at this time of the high holiday period. Remember, I need you so we can continue going. I'm here for you. Please be here for me. God's blessings. See you all soon. Shalom.